Hello everyone, this is Claudia from Mark7. Thank you all for joining us today on COVID-19 alterous dynamics demands close and attention by Council in a evolving landscape. Brought to you in partnership with H5. Before we begin, I would like to cover just a few housekeeping items, as you can see at the bottom of your screen, and multiple application widgets you can use. All those widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your, um, your uh, slide area by clicking on the right-hand side of the corners. And if you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer as many as possible, but if, it, if we run out of time uh, or a full answer is needed, don't worry at all. We will make sure to follow up with you in a separate email. A copy of today's light deck and additional health materials are available on the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or any bookmarks, any links you may find useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend you using a wide internet connection and making sure that um, uh, and making sure that um, you close any browser sessions uh, running in the background. In the background. You can find additional answers to some of the common technical issues located in the help widgets at the bottom of the screen. And finally, uh, a reminder to look out for an email within the next two hours with links to download today's session's materials. Now, without any other further delays, let's just get started. I will hand that over to Julia, who will be your panel moderator today. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who is attending today and joining us in this conversation. I'm Julia Brickle. I'm general counsel of H5, a company that's in the technology space. I uh, started my career as a litigator in private practice and have now been uh, in-house for a significant period of time. So we obviously know that 2020 has been an unprecedented year and we've seen pandemic, social protests, climate-related drama uh, in the form of fires and uh, floods and hurricanes and um, we have a divisive political environment. So um, we are focusing today on COVID-19, but obviously um, those other changes are part of the landscape. So our topics in particular on COVID uh, relate to investigations and litigation landscape, attitudes of judges and jurors, litigation readiness strategies, how we're handling the changes in technology protocols, and um, bottom line, uh, from in-house counsel perspective, what in-house counsel expects of outside counsel in this changed environment. We have a terrific panel with us today, um, and I thank you all for joining. Uh, Dan Cooper, he is a lawyer, uh, longtime expert in communications with the prior of fact, so effective jurors uh, involved in jury selection, and effective communication with uh, both jurors and judges. Meredith Friedman, who is an in-house counsel at HSBC North America. Meredith heads up US litigation for global banking and markets and leads regulatory and investigation, uh, internal investigation work. And Meredith is also a longtime litigator. Gaja Gobina is a litigation partner at Hogan Levels. He's the former deputy chief of the fraud section of the criminal division of the DOJ and also served as a prosecutor in the DOJ's civil division. And Alana Rutherford, who is uh, in-house now at Visa, heading up all intellectual property litigation. And uh, Alana is a longtime litigator uh, with many, many years as a partner in private practice. So thank you all for joining us. COVID has uh, clearly impacted um, really uh, the U.S. from coast to coast and every state in the country. Uh, we have seen more than 6.5 million cases that are confirmed cases of COVID. In New York City, uh, one in 34 people has been confirmed to be effect infected. Uh, we have uh, approaching 200,000 um, people who have died from this disease. Uh, many of the people infected suffered uh, long illnesses. Uh, we had overwhelming rates of hospitalizations, long-time intensive care stays, invasive treatments, uh, 
isolation of patients from their family. We've seen uh, business closures. Uh, from the, the lockdowns have affected business, they've affected law firms, uh, they've affected um, courts, many, probably a majority of state courts and many local courts across the country closed their doors. Uh, federal courts have um, an endless array of arrangements they've made court by court, uh, changing as the pandemic ebbs and flows in different areas. Um, some 20 million, I've seen estimates as high as 40 million people have been um, become unemployed, uh, at least temporarily as a result of COVID. And um, we've seen social changes, including early release of prison inmates and um, choices about incarceration that uh, has also affected society. The in impacts have been disparate, hitting lower income, um, minority and marginalized groups much more heavily uh, than other populations. So uh, with that stage setting, let's talk about the challenges that these changes have um, brought to us. And um, we'll come back around and talk about solutions uh, later on. So um, Pujan, uh, perhaps you can start us off. You're a litigator, you've um, worked in the government. Um, we have a um, situation where the government has been heavily involved uh, in business arrangements. Um, lots of money has flowed. What do you see uh, as the litigation and investigation uh, pattern now, and what do you foresee the trend to be? Yes, uh, thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, what we've seen is an unprecedented amount of money coming out of the government in, in a historically short period of time. Um, you know, just uh, in terms of loans to large businesses, we've seen a half trillion dollars go out. We've seen 700, almost $700 uh, billion dollars go out to the uh, Payroll Protection Program or PPP program, uh, over $100 million to hospitals. Uh, you got the government buying billions of dollars of medical equipment, ventilators, personal protective equipment. Um, and then on top of that, you have uh, Operation Warp Speed, right, where the government has organized a historically rapid clinical testing program for a COVID vaccine. So just there are a lot of different things happening that in and of themselves, each would have been massive sort of government programs that uh, unfortunately, you know, lend themselves to potential fraud or potential potentially running a of government laws and regulations. Um, in the short term, we haven't seen, I haven't seen a, a ton of investigations yet, but that's going to change rapidly. And I think that's for a couple of different reasons. Number one, you know, the, uh, you know, the government was basically trying to get this money out as quickly as possible. You know, they, the, the economy had been shut down. Uh, you know, there's an effort to try and make, make the PPP loans and the large business loans as quickly as possible. You know, everybody's focused on the vaccine, not the process by which you get to a safe vaccine, the clinical test testing. I mean, they want a safe vaccine, obviously, but, you know, it's really the, the, the end goal that's really driving the process there. Um, but that's that, that, that being said, um, you know, there's going to be investigations, massive investigations. You know, um, a lot of these government, uh, uh, fraud, a lot of government fraud cases originate with whistleblowers um, mm -hmm. and whistleblowers coming out and letting the government know what they think is alleged fraud. Um, and, you know, there's probably our whistleblowers right now alleging that there's fraud in connection with whether it's a PPP loan that was made, uh, maybe alleging, uh, you know, fraud with respect to, you know, the accuracy of clinical testing results, things like that. There's probably a whistleblower there. Um, and that whistleblower is not necessarily always justified in what they're saying. Uh, you know, oftentimes they're driven by, you know, employment disputes. But that notwithstanding, they're out there. They're going to be making allegations. Uh, there, there's a whole whistleblower bar out there um, that follows the money. So, you know, again, with over $1.5 trillion in either loans or government spending at, at a minimum in, in the, over the last several months, uh, you know, the, the investigations are sure to follow. Um, now, in terms of focus, I think they'll focus on three different issues. Um, you know, obviously, the largest uh, component of this is the are the loans that are being made, um, and there you're going to see issues, investigations related to eligibility for for loans, whether it's PPP loans or the large uh, corporate uh, loan program. Um, you're going to see, uh, you know, investigations related to the use of those funds, whether the funds were used for the purposes behind the PPP program or not. Um, you're also going to see, I think, uh, in terms of the clinical testing. Uh, there are a, a, different, a lot of different risk areas for companies. Um, you have uh, uh, risk areas in terms of like the processes in place to make sure that, that the testing is done safely and effectively. You're going to have, particularly for companies that are global in nature, 
Um, you know, there's going to be risks related to data privacy because data privacy laws vary across the globe are much more stringent in Europe, for example. Um, and you're also going to see, you know, I think in, in the clinical testing space, um, you know, potential issues related to anti-bribery and corruption, because uh, a lot of times this clinical testing is obviously overseen by government entities and there's certain countries that are a high risk for potential bribery and corruption with respect to uh, testing and drug approvals. So all in all, it, it's coming. Uh, it's definitely coming, and it's going to. And, and I think there's going to be a, t a ton of significant investigations, certainly by the, by the end of this year, going to next year. Thank you. And do you do you see um, a new array of challenges for your in-house clients coming out of this? Can you categorize those. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think the challenges are, you know, uh, again, a lot of my clients are working in heavily regulated areas, uh, and those regulations extend to a lot of different things. Where, for example, I represent a lot of pharmaceutical companies, so sales and promotion of drugs is obviously a heavily regulated area. And so I think some of the biggest challenges I see for, for our, my clients are without that sort of day-to-day -day contact with employees because of COVID, um, you know, there's potential risks there that, that people feeling less supervision might engage in riskier behaviors. Um, and so when, a lot of what I, my counseling is, has been recently has been focused in on, you know, how do we make sure that you have systems in place to account for that? Um, and, and certainly on the, in the compliance space, uh, there, there, are, there are several things companies can do um, to, to help, you know, um, you know mitigate the risk, uh, including data monitoring, increased data monitoring, uh, and just making sure that you, you've reviewed your compliance programs to, to have them take into account you know, that, that uh, this new era of remote working. Okay, we'll probably return to that um, and, and talk about it more deeply. Meredith, you're um, obviously in-house and Alana is. Meredith, do you, um, how do you see uh, challenges unfold day to day from the in-house perspective? Yeah, thanks, Julia. I mean, I think from a financial institution like HSBC, the challenge for us, um, well, there's, there are several, but one of the largest challenges we had to deal with was how do you supervise um, traders who are, you know, using these platforms and supervision is a huge part of compliance and it's a huge part of, um, you know, the regulatory scheme. So how do you make sure that you're now supervising when you have people that are supervisors who are not physically in the same room as their traders? And so figuring that out and pivoting very quickly to a new way of, you know, supervising individuals using um, Zoom and, and another technology like that uh, was something that we had to grapple with very quickly. Um, and we had to do it in a manner where we could assure all of the regulators that regulate, you know, banks and other um, financial institutions that we were doing this um, sufficiently, right? And that, that was um, a significant challenge for us. We were also dealing with the PPP program and um, as you've just heard, you know, the investigations will start soon enough. And, you know, one of the ways that they will be looking at it's, is there any internal fraud involved with the PPP? So it's something that a lot of financial institutions are making sure that they're looking at um, themselves internally, right? We're, we're investigating to see, did we do everything the right way? Did we uphold, you know, whatever guidelines we had um, publicly informed our customers that we would follow? Um, so, so there are a lot of investigations and a lot of challenges in the regulatory space that financial institutions like HSBC had to grapple with immediately, and we've we've gotten over those hurdles. Um, but obviously, there there will be new hurdles right in front of us. Right. And you you handle investigations, you handle mediation often. Are you seeing new challenges arrive arise in those yeah, areas? Yeah, I mean. I, I think, I mean, I think some of the challenges we have, right, for, for example, investigations. So when you're conducting investigations that involve employees, um, very often you will obviously need to have an employee interview. And very often these investigations move at a very quick pace. Um, and, you know, it used to be that you would have a group of individuals who are part of this investigations team in a room and you would ask an employee, right, to come into the room and you would you would conduct an investigation and you would have your documents. Um, and if there had to be any sort of what I would call free form, right, you're used to that. You're a litigator, you can, you can, you know, think very quickly, you've got the documents in front of you. You don't have that ability anymore, right? So you have to find 
um, if you have to, in, in, you know, interview an employee, you've got to make sure that that employee is at home. Um, you're, it's very difficult to um, grab somebody and sort of, you know, surprise them with an interview because you have to schedule it over a Zoom. You have to make sure that you have every single document you think you want to use and, and ask, you know, use as the basis for a question. It has to be PDF'd and up there so that you can instantly share your screen on Zoom and ask the person questions about these documents. It's very difficult to freeform, and it's also very difficult for the other people on the Zoom, the other members of your investigations team, um, you, you know, to sort of jump in because you, you don't want to be speaking over each other. We use Zoom at HSBC, and I think it's actually a fantastic platform, but it's, you know, only one person can be speaking at a time. So it, it just changes the dynamic from, you know, when you're all in a room together to where one person at a time, and you really should be working out ahead of the interview to the extent you have the time to do this, you know, who's going to be covering what and which order you're going to, to proceed in because otherwise it, it can become very unorganized and very difficult to accomplish using a platform like Zoom or WebEx or whatever it is that your, your company uses. So I found um, right away that I had to change and, and the people that I'm working with from you know our fraud team and our HR team and other lawyers, we had to change and pivot very quickly to a different way of getting our jobs done and making sure that we were getting it done effectively. Um, and it, it, was, it was a challenge, right? And, and we were able to, to overcome that, but I found that I had to completely change the way I was used to conducting investigations. Um, so that was, that was one particular challenge that, um, you know, that I had to deal with, the supervision of employees and compliance. That was another particular challenge that our entire institution, right, had to deal with. And, and um, you know, we were able to use platforms like Zoom and, and, and other means of, you know, evidencing and, and complying with our supervisory obligations. But that was, you know, that required a lot of brainstorming and coming together to create, you know, a new, a new means of, of, of accomplishing this um, using the technology that was available to us and making sure that our regulators were comfortable with it. Um, so that was that was a challenge we had to deal with back in March. The investigations that was a, that's been an ongoing challenge. I think we're in a much better place now, but it's definitely been uh, evolving as 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 you know this pandemic and the working from home situation has gone on for a longer period. And you had mentioned um, one other thing to me earlier. You had mentioned the challenge of people who are offboarding. Could you say a word about that? Um, you mean, um, Empl employees the, off board. Yeah. Dealing I mean, the employee the, issue, the technology. Yeah. That's, that's another, um, difficult one where people are, uh, we see a lot of employees who, um, you know, people want to try and use, um, programs that they have on their phones and that are not permissible. And I, I, I think some people think that they can get away with it more because they're not physically in the space. Um, we've had challenges where in investigations, you know, people would say things like, oh, well, you know, I can't, I can't speak with you right now, or I, I can't show you my phone, or I can't pull up that text or that email because I have a new phone and I'm downloading. And these are things that you can't, you can't actually confirm or challenge because you're not in the same room with the person. And that becomes a very particular um, challenge during an investigation, which, you know, every company has its own policies about what programs are permitted and how people have to respond during an investigation, what they have to do. Each company will have to deal with that differently, but it's, it's definitely a, a new challenge. It's not something I ever had to deal with before where somebody would say, oh, well, you know, I just have a new phone and I'm downloading things. So sorry, I can't show you anything. And it's like, how do you, how do you challenge that? I suppose you could ask someone to hold up their phone on, on, on the video, um, but it's not like you're in their home, right? They're sitting in their, their own home. And, and um, if they say, you know what, I'm really sorry, I'm not available to even get on a Zoom with you at this time, it's very difficult for you to challenge that you're not actually there. Whereas it used to be when we were in the office, we could just go up to somebody and say, hey, we'd like to have a sit down with you. Can you, can you please, you know, come to this conference room and meet with us? And, and, that's, and that's, being, that's, you know, obviously been a, a, a big challenge. 
Okay, thanks. Alana, <laughs> let's, let's turn to you because you're handling litigation as well from an in-house perspective. And of course, we hear about you know, Zoom hearings and Zoom sentencing and uh, Zoom trial bombing now this week uh, came out in the news. What are you seeing in the way of court activity and, and what's happening for you? So, uh, you know, going back to March at the beginning of the pandemic and what I thought, I thought, you know, civil litigation where there was only money at stake uh, would slow down if not stop. And the courts would take up the criminal side more than the civil litigation side. In fact, at least for me, what has been true is that all the cases have gone ahead um, on, on the civil side. Um, probably, and I, you're, we're seeing this borne out by the statistics, um, more cases are being decided on the papers. But I, I'm aware that hearings are being conducted by Zoom, trials are being conducted by Zoom. And strangely enough, trials are being conducted in person in certain places. I've now heard uh, two stories uh, and the Eastern District of Texas, uh, where in-person trials are going forward. Uh, one involves a co-defendant in another case of mine um, who who've been, who've been told that they have to fly all their witnesses out and they're doing an in-person trial. People are expected not to wear their mask in court. Um, social distancing will be observed, but nothing to obscure uh, the, the trial presentation. And uh, from another team that's also uh, about to start a trial in the Eastern District of Texas, luckily, again, not my company, um, I've heard from the jury consultant that they're trying to sequester the, the trial team from who is mostly D.C. and New York based in their hotel because uh, it's, you know, as you know, in real life, it's become a real political hot button issue, whether you wear a mask or not, and they don't want the the lawyers from the team tainting the potential jury tri tri uh, trial pool by walking around the streets of that town with their masks on. Uh, yes, things you never expected to be uh, important are, 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 are very much in play these days. So that's uh, some just some stories. But you know, there's as you know, there's a whole host of questions that arise if you're having a a trial at this time and what happens if someone gets sick? How do you guarantee that witnesses uh, will come? And can you can you say a witness is unavailable if technically you control the witness, but because of quarantine and all those other things, uh, how do you control all, for all that? So that's a, a, a big issue. I, I am worried uh, as a complete aside um, because I think courts, this has been a pattern we've seen for decades, courts have more and more decided things on the papers, and that trend has continued in, in, in full during uh, quarantine, that we will really see, uh, you know, we will end up in a place where less than 1% of cases actually gets heard live in trial. And I do think there is something lost about getting out the truth and also developing actual trial lawyers in, in uh, that process. What about the criminal side? Do you you have you work with an organization, uh, the Avenues for Justice? Can you tell us about that. So yes, I work with a um, a nonprofit that uh, deals with uh, juvenile offenders. So uh, I'm for, through that. I'm familiar with the the criminal side. And what I've been surprised by is there's uh, until recently I've heard now uh, this in the last week and a half. Uh, New York courts are coming back and, and starting to do grand juries and starting to uh, uh, hear indictments and things like that. But uh, there was a huge pause in any criminal uh, cases, and they just were not heard. Um, and most people could guarantee that the, the witness would stay around thanks to quarantine. And so the, people did feel the need to proceed. Obviously, this is the opposite of be but that's how it's it's going and you know i whether it's criminal or civil i think you know covid has raised a whole host of discovery issues as to what how we uh handle cases and what uh privilege looks like and 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 a, a lot of other things you know if we, i was talking to some of my colleagues and we were all talking about how we probably would never feel the need to do an in-person mediation again, because mediations over Zoom seem to work really effectively. 
However, you know, on the flip side of that, prepping a witness is much harder <laughs> um, over Zoom. I mean, in some ways it's easier, they, the witness feels more comfortable. So I think when it comes uh, down to the day of testifying, it's probably a lot easier. But in actually being able to prep the witness, we read their body language, all, all the things that are cues for, for um, understanding what's going on. You don't get that uh, you know, over Zoom or any other platform when you're online, which makes it much harder to do this. Yeah, and, and actually, Alana, I was going to say, Julie, I'm sorry. It, it's a really good point because that you, you made two really interesting points. I mean, first of all, in mediations, you know, yeah, you can do all these mediations by Zoom and you're like, I don't have to travel anymore. And But depending on the nature of the case, you know, sometimes you have mediations where getting the other side to travel to you if it's like a significant case. And, and we have cases where we have people coming in from overseas. I've had cases where I had to go from New York to Los Angeles and getting the deal done before the return flight home, that pressure sometimes was, was instrumental in achieving the settlement right at the, at the end of the day. And that pressure is now gone. And it's much easier to end a mediation um, and just say, you know what, I'm done here and hang up. Then it would then to, you know, pack up your things and leave and get on a plane and have to travel all the way back to where you wherever you came from. And and it's it's really interesting because I find that um, for the smaller cases, it's so much easier now. We don't have to travel and it's great. We we don't have to deal with that expense. But for some of the larger cases, um, it, that pressure is gone and it makes it even sometimes more difficult to achieve that settlement. Um, and then when you were talking about, you know, prepping witnesses is much more difficult. And, and I have found that as well when I'm dealing with in-house people, they're distracted. Like when they were in the room with me, it was, it was great. And now they're looking at different screens and sometimes it's hard to get them to focus on the things that I want them to focus on for, you know, like there could be a very complex deposition coming up and they're doing them on zoom. So everything is, you said a lot of it's all moving forward now and I have to prep them and they're looking at different screens and they have kids running around and things going on and putting aside the privilege issue, it's the focus issue, right? How can I get somebody to really focus on what's going on when there's a lot of distraction that they used to not have to deal with when they were sitting in the room with me in a conference room and I would take away their, you know, their phones and everything and they could only focus on what was in front of them. And now they've got a million things going on. It makes it very difficult um, to prep people. All, all really good points, Meredith. And, you know, I didn't think about the the pressure of the of the time constraint and also the friction. You know, we all we all know about court uh, court step settlements and uh, right before a trial. Um, if you're not experiencing sort of the you know the the appearance of this big monolithic building with the flags waving outside and and how the courtroom set up to sort of like have the judge as king you might not feel that same sort of uh pressure to to uh to either settle or really think about what you're doing and 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 when you take the the additional pressure of the money of uh as in the cost of travel and and hotels and all of that out of the picture that also uh, plays a part in how we settle cases. Right. So, so Alana, you and Meredith both mentioned privilege. Um, what can you say a word about the privilege concerns that you've seen arise? Um, I, and you mentioned in connection with some of the criminal, uh, the juvenile defendants uh, that Avenues for Justice works with. So I, I think, you know, privilege is a, is a huge issue during the pandemic. Uh, I, yes, I've seen it a lot with our, you know, in talking with uh, the caseworkers we have with our juvenile defendants, but it also equally applies to just anyone who's not lucky enough to have sort of a private space to work out of um, on both the attorney and, and the client side. A lot, of, a lot of our kids and I'd say a lot, even some attorneys working at home don't have a private space to communicate when they're online. So you have your computer set up in maybe in your kitchen and uh, your spouse, your child, whoever walks through the room, your roommate. Um, and, and the question is, is, is privilege breach because of that? Do we have to create new uh, sort of exceptions to the to the privilege rule based on, on COVID-19? Um, you know, as a precautionary measure, one of the things I told 
uh, the people I work with in this charity to do is do sort of a general wellness check online where you can see the person, but actually having a privileged phone call, try and do that via phone where people can get into a room and, and, and do it sort of privately or even, you know, I, I've had a, a friend of mine tell me because he lives in a loft area that he often goes to the bathroom because it's the only place that has full walls in, in his house to do really important calls. Great. Thank you. It's good consideration for everyone. Um, so let's let's turn to the trier of fact. Let's let's talk about jurors and judges, Dan. So can you? Um, Tell us what kind of problems um, you've seen emerge with COVID. Sure, and thanks. I, um, as you might expect, I, I I do tend to look at these problems from the perspective of the uh, trier of fact, uh, most often the jury. But I do want to do I do want to sort of endorse a couple of things that that Meredith and Alana have said. One is I I, I do think there's a risk. Um, not that 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 jury trials will disappear entirely, but that the trend towards um, trying cases to juries that we've seen uh, over the the past couple of decades is going is going to be accelerated by the difficulty of the issues that 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 have been created by um, the pandemic, um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done by uh, those of us in, in the system, so to speak, who um, at least want to keep the possibility of effective trials by juries in complex matters alive. And um, the, doing that, we're identifying where that work is and what needs to be done uh, is really important, um, just to follow up on what Alana was saying. And, and one of the points that Meredith made is, was, is really telling to me, and that's that in her, in, 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 in her practice, um, she's had to adjust her investigation, investigative process, uh, because of the technology. It raises an interesting question when you, when you don't have the option of, or, or at least it's a questionable option of changing group dynamics. So, so it would, it's hard for me to envision an, a, a, a fair and effective jury deliberation that is not a group deliberation that is, that is done sort of in linear fashion, one speaker at a time. So, in the when you don't have the option of adjusting sort of the order of, of conversation how do how do you how do you um uh address the need for group interaction and group dynamics uh it's a it's it's a it's a really interesting problem that that the courts i think are are grappling with and have have come up with a variety of of approaches, but but I don't think anybody's come up with a with a with a really um, improved method for for ensuring that juries can in fact deliberate. Um, it, it social distance and deliberate at the same time. So uh, in terms of the pro in terms of the problem areas, at least. Um, it, I think they fall into a variety of buckets, but if you just go to sort of the basics of 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 the system from the juror perspective, um, and from the court's perspective, we know time matters, and and as some of the speakers have already said, um, even the courts in the Eastern District of Texas that are trying to push their uh, calendars ahead are only able to do it on a very adjusted and modified schedule. And all courts, I think, or most, are falling well behind and facing an enormous backload. Um, and, and there are some really, really important issues about how 
that backlog is going to be addressed and the pressures that courts are putting on parties and counsel to make decisions, either mediation or um, settlement uh, decisions out of, in a sense, necessity and convenience rather than out, out of uh, um, a, a firm strategic choice. So I, I think this, the, 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 the delay that, and the backlog that has been caused is a big problem. I think that the, the fact that courtrooms, courthouses are restricted in their space make it difficult to redesign and alter spaces that are going to be accommodating to jurors and to lawyers and to judges so that they are feel safe in those spaces. Um, and I guess from what uh, Lana mentioned, it's not just the spaces uh, within the courthouse, it's the spaces in the community. Um, how how are you going to adjust your sort of accommodations for lawyers who are coming in and working from out of town so that they 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 once they get to the venue they're comfortable working in that venue and the venue is comfortable having them work there i think that there are significant effects on the jury the, the the jury pool in a lot of venues and who is going to be recruited and who's going to show up and what changes there 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 have been what changes there might might be needed in um in uh, soliciting or summoning jurors having them actually show up and then selecting them i think the demographics in some places are going to shift in some so, dramatic ways. So and, let me let me let me interrupt sure. you and ask the the jurors are. Can you characterize what's happening with jurors or what may be happening depending on the environment? Well, I think I, I think the I think the the fairest answer from my perspective is that is is that jurors are just. A pool of jurors is just supposed to be a representative sample of the community at large. And so we know, we know, we think we know from, um, from what we're seeing at the community at large that, that there is enormous, some of the things you mentioned earlier, polarization, there's increased anxiety, there are more obviously health issues, there are difficult financial challenges. These are all things that included in the panoply of things that the community is experiencing, and hence what the, what the potential jury pool is going to be experiencing. And it's going to, as a result, change uh, you know, with respect to demographics, for example, there may be there may be fewer people at risk who are prepared to show up, older jurors, people with underlying conditions. What do, what do we do about, the, about that group, that demographic, um, in terms of uh, accommodating their needs and their anxieties, while at the same time not taking those important sort of groups or subgroups out of the out of the pool in terms and, of in term, so can sorry. I ask you another the, the you had, had mentioned delay and I'm shifting a little bit to solutions but um, delay slows things down what do we do as trial counsel uh, and in-house counsel what what should we be expecting our outside counsel to be doing during that delay right are there solutions built into that are there opportunities? Right. At a, at a, at a minimum, um, I think that it's important to look at there are disadvantages or problems created by time, but there are also opportunities, as you said. And, and I think that, that, that 
the the uh, two of the things that time allows for that often isn't uh, available as trials are approaching in the pre-pandemic uh, era were, was to reassess some of your assumptions, whether those those assumptions were uh, about witnesses or about themes or about motions or about jurors the delays the delay and there there won't there won't be a lot of civil complex civil jury trials i don't believe in until at least the second half of 2021 this is a time to question all your pre-pandemic assumptions about how you're going to try your case and who you're going to try your case to and whether you're going to try the case and um not simply move ahead knowing that you're existing in a now a changed environment based on what i'll say are old assumptions so now's the time to put in the work is a short answer Right. Julie, I would agree with that. I would say that, you know, in the next six months to a year, we'll see sort of a reimagining of everything from how we use a courthouse to what needs to be done in person. Um, for example, I, I'd say most hearings could continue online and Zoom. But, yeah, you will eventually get to a point where you will be having trials in the courthouse and maybe taking over more rooms uh, uh, for jury deliberations and things like that in order to give people adequate space to deliberate. Um, and I think we're, we're, there's a lot of things that we're going to have to, to, to rethink. I, I do think that this particular period in time favors the organized. And, and I know this is something most people don't want to admit, but not all lawyers are organized. <laughs> and I think the, the people who are able to, uh, prepare and uh, get things like books of documents ready and out the door and, and to their witnesses um, early in, a, in an organized fashion are, are the people who are going to really be able to do well during this time because I, it's not always uh, easy or helpful with you know glitches in technology to present documents solely online. Having them there in person, having people open up a sealed uh, box uh, online to, sh to show to show that they're seeing the documents for the first time or open it like in front of the judge will will be the way forward and how people do things. Yeah, if I could just sort of jump in real quick as well. I think, um, you know, we are, gonna, we are gonna see potentially a significant changes in the jury pool and that's gonna affect decision-making about, for example, do you want even a jury, right? Uh, you know, I deal, for example, in, you know, a lot of fraud, fraud defense. Uh, and, you know, typically, you know, defense lawyers in my area like to have juries because one of our principal defenses is about how complicated the situation is. There's complex regulations and rules and how could the conduct you, you're attacking be considered really fraud. Um, that might change. You know, if you, look, if you have a jury trials with uh, that are on, over Zoom and people are easily distracted, as, as, as Meredith and Alana pointed out, happens. Um, you know, I, I don't want that distraction, right? I want them to be focused. And so maybe I want to have a judge, uh, depending on who the judge is and what their predisposition is. So, uh, you know, I think that the, there are going to be significant changes, regardless of whether or not, you know, the, the vaccines work and we get back to something close to normal in the next year and a half. It's still going to change who's going to be in that jury pools. And frankly, jury pools, traditionally, while they're supposed to represent and be a cross representation of the community, they oftentimes aren't. And I think it's going to be an even narrower slice of, of, of our communities uh, going forward. And can I just and, add one one, one thought about about uh, judges? You know, from my perspective, um, what I find is often judges are not are not that much different. They're just just a one person jury, and the the anxieties, the tensions, the pressures, um, the experiences that many in the jury pool are are dealing with, including this change in 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 whether and how uh, effective or well somebody pays attention, I think are likely to be felt being felt by a lot of judges as well, certainly the older judges. And so I think as you as you work through this question of 
do you, do you want a, a jury or do you want a judge? It, it was always the case to understand your judge as best you could. It is especially important now before you make that decision to assess the judge the same way you assess jurors and gather as much, as much information about their experiences, not just what they've, they've written, but, but study the judge the way you would study a jury. Go watch them. If, 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 you, if there's a way, listen, see what kind of changes, see what questions they've been asking other litigants and understand how they're thinking and feeling in the same way that you would try to understand how potential jurors are thinking and feeling. So, uh, and, and actually, Dan, Dan's comment raised a point for me is what's really changed is public access to courts and trials, and n not only for lawyers to examine and see uh, people in action, but uh, for the public more generally to see what's going on because of the Zoom bombing and things like that. Um, restricted access and is has become the norm in a lot of these um, uh, what would otherwise be public hearings or, or, or trials and and even for the ones that uh, are still unrestricted um, because you don't know the date the time and all these other things that are going on it's 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 harder to maintain what what has been uh, sort of a, a key premise in, in, in trials which is the public access. But it's better for our communications departments at the, at the institution, right? Because we we're now we're not seeing the you know the media release the next day or just later that same day about what happened oral argument. Um, it's actually it's really funny, but we don't we don't get that anymore, right? You, they wait until the the judge issues a decision and they see the writing and then they they say something in the media, but. We used to always have to worry about the media at oral arguments and, and other hearings, even just boring hearings. You would get these ridiculous uh, media reports sometimes. And, oh, look at that. Um, and we don't have to, we don't, and then of course, another distraction. We don't, we don't have to worry about that anymore because we don't really see that. Um, so it's really funny. There's it, definitely it helps it <laughs> let, me turn us, let me turn us back for a second to the courtrooms and the technology. So we've, you know, we've talked about Zoom. Um, we now, I've lost my slides, but I hope you can see that we've got a courtroom with plexiglass um, and a courtroom. Um, not entirely clear if I'm able to the next one out, um, courtrooms with um, witnesses blocked in um, as if they're preserved in a museum. Um, is that, and then we have the Zoom technology and the other options if we're doing uh, long distance trials. What do lawyers need to be thinking about and doing to um, deal with these different, with these changes in the way that trials are going to be presented. These are new challenges from my perspective. What, what do we trial lawyers need to be doing? Well, let me, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, th I think, it, I think it, it, it's probably useful to look at from it at two moments in time. One is sort of your wish list. If it, if if you if you could design the courtroom and you could design the 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 physical and technological space for your for your case in your venue, what would what would you be asking for? Uh, would you would you be would you be asking for plexiglass screens versus masks? Would you be asking for video testimony versus in in court testimony what going through the whole list of what goes on at trial what does your wish list now look like and then how 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 much of that can you manage to actually achieve 
And then whatever you achieve in terms of how your court is going to move forward, who, who do you have that has the best skills given the physical and technological choices that have been made? Because now you have an opportunity. All, all, all lawyers are not created equal, and they don't all have the same set of strong skills. Same with witnesses, same with jury consultants, for that matter. But matching your, your human resources, so to speak, with your physical and technological resources that are now being imposed by the court as a result of the changes becomes, an, an, I think, an important part of the process. And again, going back to time, now is the time to test people, I, I believe, lawyers and witnesses, with different technological and physical, I'll call them constraints. Who is better on tape? Who is better live? Who's better with plexiglass? Who's better with masks? Who's better? What 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 form of technology is better for you in terms of the 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 projection of exhibits? Do you want to do you want to create any try to create any greater capabilities for for juror learning? For instance, Julie, you and I have talked about. Uh, uh, notebooks and and and, and or and or uh, tablets, rather than right. the exchange of the actual movement of paper in a courtroom. All those things are sort of choices or or constraints. And then the question becomes: Who do you have, and how do you make them best under those constraints? I think. And then I would add to that, um, goes a little beyond the technology, but there's the opportunity for really new analysis about the stories that will work, the themes that are going to be convincing to the new, uh, the, today's jury that you're, you're going to have, and who are, what trial counsel are effective in hearing jurors and anticipating and planning ahead um, to to test ideas in advance and be ready for the new environment. We, we don't know to change equally well. I think, and I think that's um, also a big part for for internal counsel, right? That's that's you know for people like like me and Alana. I mean, that's you know figuring out which is who's the right lawyer for this for this particular trial. Who does well on Zoom versus in person? And it may not be. You would think that if you do really well live in a courtroom, that that would translate on the um, technology, on the video, but it's not always the case. And so, you know, you know, maybe have a moot and see how your, your outside counsel performs because you may switch up your person depending on the, the technology and the medium and the particular arrangement that you have. Uh, so it's something that internal counsel has to think about when they're selecting the right counsel for this particular matter, whether it's a mediation or a hearing or a trial, right? I 100% agree with what Meredith says. I think it's really important um, during this period to to give yourself the time to reconsider everything. You know, test people out because it's a different format and it's a different case and requires a slightly different skills than than what was needed pre-pandemic. And yeah, presumably. I just want to add one other point, which yep. is that, you know, from the perspective of trial strategy, it also changes things. I mean, if you have, you may choose, oftentimes I choose witnesses just, you know, obviously based on their effectiveness and the point I want to make, or if I want to reemphasize a point, uh, you know, some witnesses are not, you know, it can be, you know, the, having distractions there can make it harder for jury, you know, juries less likely to listen to them. So you may want to, all these like changes will also affect, I think, who you put on and how you put your evidence on. Can I just add one other thought to that, which is back to time. I think everybody everybody is feeling different about time. There's an urgency that a lot of people feel. And I think one of the things as you think about 
how you try your case and who tries your case and what case you try is how how are you going to make it as efficient and effective as you can and maybe the the thought of a time trial which you rejected pre-pandemic is a is a approach that you might want to reconsider as alana said post-pandemic because the patience and attention of jurors at least is is going to be challenged and you want to be on the right side of thinking of 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 their belief that you're helping them with respect to time and anxiety not increasing their 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 problems with time and anxiety thank you i i'm time challenged as everybody who knows me knows and um we wanted to save a couple minutes for um, questions, and I wanted to, um, in that regard, um, go back uh, to a little bit of a rough change in topic, but I wanted to go back to um, have you address a question. Um, what are three things that companies can do to better address compliance? So taking us back to the beginning of the conversation, um, what, what, what are the takeaways? Uh, for today, three things they can take away, what the audience can take away. Sure, I'll give you an answer at 30,000 feet, 20,000 feet, and 10,000 foot level. level. Um, at the 30,000 foot level, just, uh, I, you know, and I've been counseling clients recently on this, is just reevaluating their compliance programs to make sure that they adequately address all the, the litigation risks that the company's facing, as well as being adequately resourced, and that the policies themselves sort of take into account this remote working environment. So that's one thing. Um, secondly, you know what we've also what also have been doing in the compliance space is, is uh, working with companies to enhance their data monitoring, because you, you know because of, because of the limitations on the ability to investigate that Meredith pointed out, um, sometimes data monitoring can really help you know fill the gap, uh, and as long as companies are good about making the data a access um, available to the compliance department, uh, you know having a sophisticated mon data monitoring practice can fill the gap. Um, and then finally, you know, there are certain policies probably that, that, you know, companies need to think about a little bit more in depth. You know, as Meredith was pointing out, sometimes you can't get into someone's phone, obviously, when, when you're doing a Zoom interview. Um, but if you change or bring your own device policy to maybe mandate for certain employees or in high risk areas that they have to have a company phone, then that access is easier to get. Um, so there's a variety of things that companies can do to sort of help mitigate the risks and avoid, hopefully, lots of the investigations that we're, we're finding are so challenging to do. And then, and we had talked earlier, the Department of Justice has um, been pressing toward uh, looking at data, right? Yeah, say exactly. More yeah, so DOJ has emphasized the, the, what they think is a strong need in, in compliance on data monitoring. So it's, it's what, they want, what they expect for companies, and frankly, it's a best practice for companies just in light of what's going on with COVID and remote working. Okay. Um, we have a litigation question, um, which I think I think I'll throw back to in-house counsel, but we'll, we'll see anybody can answer it. Um, and that's with everyone working remotely. Have you seen changes in how companies manage preservation? So, I mean, I think for HSBC, I mean, it's interesting. We we prevent it. We don't have the ability to print off premises. So for us, it's really it's all about the electronic with everybody working remotely. So you cannot print from home. It's all about the electronic. We had really shifted to an electronic means of document preservation recently. So it, it has it has actually dovetailed along with that process. So the timing was, was good for us. But I think for companies where people are permitted to print, um, not, not required to do it you know, on premises, you're gonna have a problem because people have the ability to print documents um, at home, so they can create and print. Um, they can make notes. They can change things and print and destroy, right? And and there's no there's no safe place for these documents, and there may not even be a safe place to destroy them. So I think that that's something that um, in house should be thinking about, and if needed, changing policies and procedures to um, account for this, right? And and to adjust your your procedures accordingly to to um, take into all take this into account. Thank yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it hasn't really been an issue or one that I've seen uh, come up so far. But I do think paper documents are 
are in a question mark and it's an outstanding problem that no one is effectively addressed. I think it's very easy for most places now um, due to the technology uh, to to collect their their electronic documents um, based on software we have, but uh, both the documents in the offices that nobody's in and, and the, the new documents that are generated at home that are in hard copy form are, are out there and unable to be um, collected and examined in the same way. Right. So we're, we're out of time. I think our call to action um, that we've landed on is to realize that the dynamics have changed uh, considerably and that intuition uh, from the past may not be applicable to the solutions needed for the future, uh, that we should engage in strategic planning and testing of themes and ideas, uh, and that we should understand the opportunities that both the extra time we have is giving and that technologies may bring, um, as well as the uh, obviously disadvantages of the technology. So with that, um, I would thank everybody very much I uh, appreciate uh, the panel joining us and the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, for such a great insights. Um, thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Um, a reminder to look for, out for an email within the next two hours with links to downloads to these materials. Um, we'll also like your feedback. So if you can take a minute to answer our very brief survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the session, that would be very much appreciated. Once again, on behalf of H5, uh, Mark Simmons webinar, we would like to thank you all and we do hope to see you soon. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you very much, thanks everybody.